we're making it work online. Mm -hmm. So much reflection in these glasses. Okay, good to go. Uh, hello and warm welcome to everyone tuning in. My name is Tendai Mutambu, and I'm the Assistant Curator of Commissions and Public Programs at Spike Island in Bristol. It's my immense pleasure to be hosting tonight's In Conversation on the occasion of our online film commission for Dem3, Ancestral Interference by Zinzi Minot. We hope you've all had um, an opportunity to check the work out on, on the website, spikeisland.org.uk. Um, it'll be available on the website until the the 26th of November, Thursday the 26th. Commissioned and produced by Berwick Film and Media Arts Festival, Spike Island Bristol and Transmission Glasgow. For Dem3 is the third part of an ongoing moving image project and continued investigation into blackness and diaspora. On the anniversary of the Empire Windrush docking in the UK on the 22nd of June, 1948, Minot returns to the work. Each iteration is a filmic manifestation of a year lived, a body moved and moving through a reflection on the legacies of the Windrush generation. Just a bit of housekeeping um, before we begin. Our public programs seek to create an environment for critical and open-minded discussion. Our conversation will be informal this evening. And although interaction with speakers is limited, we strongly encourage that you use the chat function, um, which is available through YouTube Live. So please write questions throughout the session and we'll be fielding these around the 45 minute mark. Please note the live stream and the chat are both being recorded and a reminder that any aggressive, discriminatory or intolerant comments will be removed by our chat moderators in keeping with our aims to create a respectful and generative environment for all involved. And so without further delay, um, I'd like to introduce this evening's speakers. Zinzi Minot is an artist and dancer whose work focuses on the relationship between dance, bodies, and politics, exploring how, exploring how dance is perceived through race, queer culture, gender, and class. Zinzi is specifically interested in the place of black women's bodies within the form. As a dancer and filmmaker, she seeks to complicate the boundaries of dance, seeing her live performances, films, and objects as different but connected manifestations of dance and body-based outcomes and inquiry. Broken narratives, disturbed lineages and glitches are all used by the artist to explore the racism that one experiences throughout the span of a black life. Her work shares Caribbean stories as it highlights the histories of those enslaved and the resulting migration of the Windrush generation. Denise Ferreira da Silva is an academic and practicing artist whose work addresses the ethical and political challenges of the global present. She is the author of, among others, Toward a Global Idea of Race, University of Minnesota Press, 2007, Unpayable Debt, Sternberg and MIT Press, forthcoming. Denise is co-editor with Paula Chakravarti of Race, Empire and the Crisis of the Subprime, released by Johns Hopkins University Press in 2013. Her several articles have been published in leading interdisciplinary journals and her artist, artistic works include the film Serpent Rain 2016 and Four Waters Deep Implicancy 2018 in collaboration with Arjuna Newman. Denise has exhibited and lectured at major art venues such as the Pompidou Centre in Paris, Whitechapel Gallery in London, MASP in Sao Paulo, the Guggenheim in New York and MoMA in New York as well. She's also written for publications as part of major art events, including Liverpool, Sao Paulo, and Venice Biennials, as well as Documenta 14. Joan Anim Addo is Emeritus Professor of Caribbean Literature and Culture at Goldsmiths, University of London. She's Director of the Centre for Caribbean Diaspora Studies. Her publications include Longest Journey, A History of Black Lewisham, and The Literary History, Touching the Body, history, language, and African-Caribbean women's writing. Her co-edited books include Interculturality and Gender, as well as I Am Black, White, Yellow, an introduction to the Black body in Europe. Joan is co-editor of the Feminist Review Special Issues, Affect and Creolization, 
and Black British feminisms. Her libretto, Imoenda, beautifully subtitled, or She Who Will Lose Her Name, was the first to be written by an African Caribbean woman and was translated by Giovanna Corvi and Chiara Pedrotti. Joan is also guest editor with Maria Elena Lima of the neo slave narrative genre, a special issue, part one of Kalalu, a journal of literature, art, and culture of the African diaspora, published by Johns Hopkins University. Zinzi, Joan, and Denise, thanks so much for taking the time to be in conversation with me this evening. Of course. Um, so my, my first question is for Zinzi. I thought we might begin by setting the scene a little bit, just by discussing the dem as a series mm -hmm. and your motivations for committing to this ongoing work. Yeah, um, well, thanks for having me um, and thanks everyone for accepting the invitation. Um, I think for, for them definitely started as a, like a reactive piece of work. It wasn't something that I conceived for a long period of time. Um, the first work was made around the same time, the same year, and shortly after um, many members of the Windrush generation started to be deported. Um, simultaneously, my partner at the time was unable to stay in the UK and she had to go back to Jamaica because of visa issues. And I guess, and also, you know, my father and my uncle had been in detention um, and were at the time, either they were still trying to deport or my uncle actually decided to go back after being left indefinitely on tag for, I think it was three and a half years. And he just kind of couldn't cope with the kind of limbo that that punishment puts on people. And I think I was just exasperated. And I also was, because of the relationship I was in at the time, being made aware how much that wasn't just about a familial relationship. Up until then, I'd only ever seen this happen to my elders. I'd only ever seen it happen to my parents or and there was something that was really powerful about seeing the sadness that my mother had watching me go through it and realizing that I hadn't stopped and also me realizing that oh we're gonna do this again somehow um and yeah I was I was really angry naturally I was furious and also, I really wanted to, to, to talk back, I guess. I really wanted to talk back. My grandmother was a nurse, and I remember when the um, Windrush deportations became public, not really started happening, but became public. I also thought a lot about my grandmother, who was my last grandparent to pass away. Um, and she was a nurse, and she was very typically um, of her generation, in her belief for the mother country, her real passion to come here and help and support and rebuild. And I had this visceral feeling that I was really glad she was dead. And that was really striking. I was really happy that she didn't see this. And all of those feelings were obviously very powerful and, and disturbing. And I was really aware that nobody kind of, uh, that I could find was talking about it institutionally, creatively, it just like, like there was no attention on it. And it made me really angry at how little attention is given to Caribbean stories, even within the, the, the grouping of like black and African diasporic work. And I just had enough. I think I just had enough. I was, mm. that's where the work comes from is a real, just f like, fuck it. I just, Mm -hmm. and, and I made the film with what I had, you know, and I think that was also where it, it came from. Like I had, I think at that point, like an 11 year old MacBook and a cracked version of Premiere that a friend had given me six years ago. Um, everything that I didn't have, I stole. <laughs> so any footage that I didn't have, I just took it. Mm -hmm. I, not like artist work, but like uh, archival work. I just um, video to MP3, did, cut it up, put it in the timeline. It was clunky and it was very much what I could do. Like it was just mm. what I could do. And I, I didn't really worry so much about making it look a certain way mm. beyond my way. 
and I, I was lucky that I had been introduced to um, David from Data by Larry, Larry Achampong. And Larry had said, you know, speak to this guy. Like, you know, I think he he wants to speak to you and I can, I can say you should speak to him, I can vouch for him. And he said to me, I can give you a platform. Like if, that, if, if, if he's what you're looking for is a platform for this, I can give you that. Um, and anybody else, it was a very brief window, but I asked a couple of other people if they would show it. And it felt very consumptive. And he was the only person who was like, do what you want, say what you want. And so that's how it happened. So it was like without David and Larry making that suggestion, I, that I wouldn't have had anywhere to put it other than my own kind of world, which is actually what happened to For Them Too. For Them Too came out just through me and my website um, and then got picked up after curatorially by Taylor and um, Taylor Lamel and Rabs Lansico. So, yeah. Mm. And then obviously three is with you guys and the other two partners. Mm. Um, I'm really curious about the the thing that you mentioned about getting a sense that what you experience is something that's bound to to recur yeah. or to happen again, and somehow that seems to connect with the the format of the series, the way that it's sort of you know the number of iterations is indefinite, essentially. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Like you've you've mm-hmm. tasked yourself with responding mm-hmm. to, like you say, you say a life lived in that descriptor, that description of of the piece that we use in the synopsis. So I'm curious about yeah. like, thinking of wanting to, to make this commitment essentially for you. Yeah, I think like um, there's, there's a piece of writing that I wrote a long time ago now, maybe a decade ago called Dearest Dance. And it's like a renewing my vows to dance. Um, and I think I, I have an affection or an attraction to like repetitive, um, repetitive, repetitive structures and cyclical structures and anniversaries that I really like this like coming back to and Mm. and I I think I wanted who knows like somewhere else like in a parallel universe maybe I only ever had to make one but there was something like it felt like really important that like I committed and renewed my relationship to the generations that had sacrificed much to get me here Mm -hmm. and also ancestrally like I think a lot of the conversations I'm having in my work are also about reminders about like not accepting this kind of David Cameron-esque it's doneness (laughs) like it's it's not like something that's finished and it's some it's something that I live with on a daily basis just by virtue of my surname and so there is something that means that if coming back to it through the work kind of it anchors me and it, it, it stops me going mad because you can, the world is kind of trying to tell you we've moved past it. But then every time you write your name, you see a slave master. So coming back is a way of kind of turning the gaslighting back to zero, knowing that it, of course, will just go back off the Richter scale, but it's a reset mm. and it allows other people who share that history to, to also kind of cleanse the gaslighting potentially and those who don't have that ancestry to be reminded that, that, that we haven't gotten to the point where this can just be history if that is what history does but we're, we're definitely not at that point and and like Caribbean diasporic stories slave stories the ancestors of slaves need to be listened to like and those stories and conversations need to happen and the cultural world needs to let those stories happen within the scope of the black work that they're programming. Like that voice has to be present, even though it's like, it's deeply uncomfortable for people. Yeah. And I'm thinking as well about um, the kind of spaces that allow for this, for these stories to proliferate um, Mm -hmm. in subtle ways. Um, And I'm thinking about how you met um, Joan and Denise you mentioned about mm-hmm. sort of 10 years ago at this feminist retreat for black women. I wanted you to tell us yeah. a little bit about that encounter and what it allowed you, the kind of impression it made and the kind of space it afforded you as a thinker and a maker. Yeah. I actually just realized as you were asking me that question that the dearest dance I wrote around the same time. Um, I was living in Liverpool at the time myself, um, Jay, Jay Bernard and 
um, a friend at the time, Alice, we had, I think we'd applied for a bunch of residencies. I just graduated. Um, I think Jay was, Jay maybe had just finished something and Alice was coming to the end of something and no one had gotten anything. I was being evicted. I don't know what else was going on with other people, but there was this sense of like nothing to lose ness. Um, and I knew that I didn't, I, I knew I just finished training. I was kind of um, as fit and as strong as I was ever going to be. And I'd taken a couple of auditions and realized that I didn't want to be the only black dancer in the room <laughs> again. And, um, or what? well, it would have been the only one then, but at school it was one of few. And so we decided to move to Liverpool. Um, and we basically created our own residency. Um, I, and I signed on, I was like, don't want to work. So it was like, it's, it's a, it was a possible, it was possible to have very little money in the city at the time in a way that wasn't possible with London. And it was Jay, it would have definitely been Jay, even though I don't remember the moment. I know that the connection between me and Joan was Jay and they had said to me, you know, come. And I was like, cool. I kind of didn't really know what it was or not. Like I, but we were going to the forest and it was black and feminist. So I was like, whatever, that sounds great. I'll go. Mm -hmm. And when I got there, Denise was there and I met Joan. I think Ego was also doing some like um, oral history testimonies. And it was just like this room full of like amazing people who admittedly, like I, I knew like palpably physically that uh, there was so much genius in the room, but I also didn't know who anybody was properly. But the thing that struck me, and and I, and I'd said before, the thing that made me want to do this conversation with you two was that you both had this way of like really letting me know what black feminism was and could be, and the way that you were able to like translate deeply, kind of like complex, but also like magical, and they just kind of spiraled all into the room ideas and I really understood them I really I really could digest them in a way that I remember finding other things at the time were just I was like I couldn't I couldn't cope with what I was reading even though apparently I was supposed to be able to do it and um, because I was a black woman I was like I don't mm -hmm. understand this but I understood you too and you were really welcoming and really kind and yeah like when I thought like who do I want to have this conversation with you two were just there instantly so that that's how we had met um that's amazing um I wanted I wanted Joan to respond perhaps to to that context of the retreat and and also Denise uh yes I going through uh the those uh details again so many years later that retreat seems almost almost magical because it was such a rare thing mm -hmm. to happen um i know that i recall that ego and i had long conversations and this seemed to be something that was needed by young black women at the at that moment mm -hmm. but of course there are very few older black women around who uh would who were in that position to take up the challenge of going away for a weekend um, and sitting with a room full of uh, young black women who had in common their feminist concerns. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's not such a straightforward thing. Denise was, <laughs> Denise was, was, um, as crazy as I was, and she said yes straight away, as I recall. Uh, um, and if I remember, uh, who else was there? There was. Uh, um, I should Sarah remember. There. Sarah Ahmed Sorry? was there, no? Sarah was there, no? no? Sarah wasn't there. It was from, she's from Trinidad. Uh, anyway. 
Um, but but the idea was to get three was to get some black women feminists who who were confident about their ideas to spend time mm. with young black feminists and to develop some ideas. Mm. Um, and it was very exciting. It was a little scary. I mean, we, we'd, we'd, not, we'd not worked with each other before, mm -hmm. um, but we were, we were happy to just go in there and do it because it felt like it needed to be done and because there was a will. Uh, just so many people responded uh, to the idea positively that, you know, there was no turning back. So we went to, <laughs> we went ahead and did it. And, message, you and, it, and it was wonderful. Um, the pity is that it actually was an opportunity that is seldom, well, if at all, ever replicated. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Denise, do you, do you want to pick up on what I'm? Oh, no, no, yes, I, um, it's, it was an it was an opportunity not only for the young uh, black women, but also not so young black women back then, because I was just uh, arriving in London. You you were just young, yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, I was not so young. <laughs> I was just arriving in London, so it was important to me to have, uh, I mean, to, to, to spend time with other Black women and to have the chance, both academics and, and, uh, and artists, and to have the chance to, to converse and to, to talk about where I was, not, you know, that reporting kind of way, but actually in the thinking together mm -hmm. um, kind, mm -hmm. of, mm -hmm. kind of way. And, uh, and then things happened uh, since then. So one, one important thing is that I, I had the chance to appreciate how, what happens when the critical and the creative meet, and as we can see, you know, in, in Zinzi's work, it's so much about that. Mm -hmm. um, and, and then how generative it is. And, uh, and then from that, I also had the chance to collaborate with folks. I did some mm -hmm. work with uh, Lauren Craig, who I met there. Mm -hmm. I, I did a play with uh, Rosalind Martin, who is uh, based in Bristol. Uh, we did a play together. And then uh, last November, I was in the same program with Jay in, in Glasgow. Mm -hmm. And now we're mm -hmm. here. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. Years mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. you know, it's part it's still of- Still going. Uh, I'm thinking, yes, of course. So yeah, it's amazing. Thank you, John, for organizing. Yeah, thank, thank you. <laughs> really. I just, I, I just dream of somebody else being equally mad before very long, and and just trying that experiment again because it was really worthwhile. Mm. Yeah. Oh, you put the people listening on notice. Exactly. <laughs> got a, yeah, got quite a lot of viewers. Yep. So yep. Going to pick up the mantle. Um, mm -hmm. But Joan, speaking of the kind of the things that you sort of put forward as provocations, when we had our last conversation, um, when we first met, you made comments about um, the Caribbean poets Derek Walcott and Kamal Braithwaite. Um, and you mentioned, and then in light of the retreat as well, so I've kind of been thinking about this relationship to, to the history of their form and the conventions, let's say, of their disciplines or their genre. Um, if you will. And before we get to Zinzi's relationship to those particular things, I wondered if you could, if you could set the scene for us just by describing that tension between Braithwaite and Walcott during their earlier years. I was mm. particularly drawn to this, um, the famous Braithwaite line that you, you mentioned, the one that says, the hurricane does not roar in pentameter. Absolutely. Um, yes, the, I'm not sure that the, the tension was really between the two poets as such, but the two ways of thinking about poetry and Caribbean poetry and what it should be not only like on the page, but what it should sound like to the ear. Mm -hmm. And Walcott was in the classical school at Kamal Brathwaite, certainly was fighting against just that. He would, um, in 1984, of course, publish that very important uh, 
book, The History of the Voice, in which he um, expanded upon some of his ideas about the use of the rhythms that we were much more familiar with in the Caribbean. So his uh, declaration, if you will, that the hurricane does not roar in pentameters is one that, that takes us back and has taken uh, Caribbean poets particularly back uh, and helped them to think about how it is they're constructing their voices on the page, whether it's being constrained mm -hmm. by colonial thinking. You know, we're told this is what poetry is like. Mm -hmm. And of course, Caribbean, the Caribbean education system was a deeply colonial system. So the, the, it was all about, of course, the idea was that we didn't have poetry, we didn't have literature and so on. Therefore, we, oh, we needed to be good, to, to model ourselves very much on the best of so-called English literature, which quite often, as we grew up, we realized was not English literature. Yeah, it, that is to say, could have been Scottish literature or more likely Irish literature and so on. Uh, but it was called English literature. So, so, th so the point was that that what what, what uh, Kamal Brathwaite brought to the teaching and thinking around art forms is about the ways in which we try to make it indigenous, and therefore allow it to have more appeal to more people, because within the arts in the Caribbean and particularly within literature, there's this tension uh, between the folk and the traditional um, audience for English literature. And that traditional audience was not the folk. It's mm. not the common people. Yeah. It's the middle classes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and I wonder with um, Denise, sort of against the backdrop of this, this, I guess, Euro-American Euro insistence on, on a particular kind of history or uh, histories of, of knowledge and their kind of conventions as well. I know this is something that your work, both as a, as a theorist, as a, as a writer, as a filmmaker, is sort of attuned to pushing against enlightenment thought, for example, um, and in other parts, the current parts of your film against, say, like a Marxist tradition that insists that the slave doesn't exist, it's sort of the prehistory of capital and somehow leaves us with an account of, of capital as we know it and modernity that's somehow incomplete and doesn't quite factor. The slave. I'm curious about your relationship to, to these sort of more, um, more conventional, I guess, your American histories, if you will. Um, yeah, I think I can I can speak more um, uh, directly in in relation to knowledge, right? Mm -hmm. um, and for me, these are preoccupations that actually started even before um, I was able. I had the intellectual tools for understanding them as such, and they began um, when I was young, like you know, I was a as a teenager communist. And then when I was in my 20s, I was involved in the Black Brazilian movement. And, and, and then my, my experience as a, as a neighborhood organizer uh, involved with the Communist Party in Brazil, it didn't take long for me to understand that there was a limitation in the program. The program didn't quite get what was happening in my neighborhood, which was so much about racial subjugation. Um, so, so on the one hand, the, the, the limitations of historical materialism, and then at the same time, as a, as a black activist in Brazil um, in the eighties, as we were in the middle of you know the politics of difference, cultural politics, uh, our main arsenal was the one provided by sociological studies. And those studies could not quite account for the situation in Brazil because they assumed that miscegenation would lead to the disappearance of racial subjugation. Mm -hmm. So um, 
by the time I got to do my, um, my PhD dissertation, those two came together. Um, but in there, my, my initial move was then to go back in the history of uh, you know, modern Western philosophy and try to see what were the limitations, right? Try, try to map and trace the limitations um, at that level. So yeah, so that's how I end up engaging with the post-enlightenment. And, and then of course I found that space and time were the problem, but I'll, I'll stop here. <laughs> mm-hmm. we, can, we, can, we can pick that back up. Um, yeah. it, it opens up a lot of possibility. <laughs> and I think since your own kind of trajectory to how you came to where you are, like you've mentioned, you've given us a hint of your background in dance. Mm-hmm. And I wonder what, what it's been like for you to break out of the mold of a particular tradition of training, you know, conservatoire and like mm-hmm. working as a filmmaker who is, I guess, formally untrained, for want of a mm-hmm. better term, but then thinking mm-hmm. about, you describe yourself as editing with the body. And I really like that. Mm-hmm. Um, and how somehow you're, you're breaking the mold of, of certain, certain conventions as well. Yeah, like I was kind of struck by what you were just saying, Denise, about like the kind of overarching um, radical tool not being radical for you as like a Black communist. And I think in many ways, like many Black folks in some sort of formal structure find that the tool that they end up with is somehow not quite equipped for the thing that they're trying to do, even if it teaches you something or even a lot. And I think, you know, obviously I went to dance school because I I was really passionate about dance and I I didn't have a a normal trajectory there. I started dance school late, like for dancers after studying and working in another profession. And um, I kind of, I I realized by the time, and this is how I ended up going to Liverpool, I, I got to the point where I realized, and I was also being told actually that, I remember somebody told me who was the um, rehearsal director for a company I'd wanted to be in ever since I knew about them. So at that point, it was like three or four years. And she said to me, you know, Zinzi, you have to decide whether you want to think or dance because the dancers in this company, all they do is dance. They don't do anything else. And if you, but you have so much that you want to think about and talk about and do about, and you're going to have to make a decision. And I think at that point, like, you know, people partly with the kind of um, the racism of dance, I was constantly being encouraged off the stage. You could choreograph, you could be a technician, you could be an academic. I was really being pushed off the stage and and they had positioned me partly because of my age and the fact that I was like engaged in politics and had already had an academic degree. They had positioned me as like the bright black and they used that as this kind of oppositional perspective to the other black girl who they used to mix me up with and so they were like you should do a PhD there was this real force for me not to dance Mm. and I think a lot of um the time that like I went to Liverpool and you know I renew my vows with dance and I meet Joda Denise is really about me trying to find a way that I can dance and think at the same time and looking for that space that I wasn't told existed And actually, you know, it might not be a huge pool, but there really is a world in dance that is doing that. I was also using film. um, The first one I actually made was on the same 11 year old laptop when I first got it, because in my third year at Laban, I didn't want my um, dissertation supervisor in the room, in the rehearsals, but part of the rules was that he had to come. So I filmed it and I edited it on um is it iPlayer or whatever it is that comes free with the with the um not iPlayer iMovie free with mm-hmm. the uh, Mac it took me ages my laptop almost exploded exporting it and that was the first time I guess that I started to have this relationship to to film dance and liveness and like negotiating my own space through film and it, and that kind of carried on with one lyrical bitch that was like Really, it was a response. Again, it like happened because somebody racially attacked me on stage and then I was due to go on stage a few months later. And I was kind of traumatized and I was too scared. So I made a film in place of the performance, the live performance. Um, and my role in that performance is really like a VJ or a DJ. Um, and there's kind of an empty space and the film is behind. 
And I'd also been making, using film to make the backdrop of my work. So solo work, very, at that time, unknown artists, not getting any funding. There was no money for set. So I just make these films at the back mm. to kind of fill the space. And I think definitely my relationship to film was incremental and it was in many ways out of necessity for additional tools to do things. Sometimes it was to like multiply my voice. Other times it was to get, to, to like reclaim some right over my body, which as a dancer, you're, you're not given that, you know, you're taught to be accessible, to be watched, to be consumed, to be observed. So the idea that you would ever have any rights over how you're watched and observed is, is, com is completely out, out of your training. Mm. Um, and so it was this real kind of, um, it was like titillating to realize like, I don't have to. I just, I just don't have to. I don't have to give you my body. You, I don't have to let you watch me. I don't have to be good. I don't have to nail my turn. I don't have to do anything. And, and I, can, I can, there's some freeness in that. And this kind of editing with the body, for me, it's like I want my, I want my films to look like how I'm dancing when I'm making them. You know, like like that song, um, Dangerous, played in my flat for like five or six days while I edited that bit. It was on repeat. I was home alone. My partner had like gone to like um, like a little lockdown holiday in an Airbnb because we'd been in the house for so long. So I had the house to myself. I'm sure my neighbors must have been so annoyed because <laughs> it was just consistently on. And I was like really close to the street. I'm like, I'm danger. And it's like, I want to like put that in. And it's it's not just like um, I want people to dance. I want the it to be like a physical call and response when people watch the film. I want them to feel mm. moved to dance, but then I guess ultimately feel moved, like mm -hmm. to do to like that. It's not like something you consume wrapping a Tiffany bow and say I saw the film. It's like I want it to to be active and activate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's definitely something that's. Um that's really prominent in the work. And I wanted to ask mm -hmm. um, if Joan and Denise wanted to jump in with their, their kind of first impressions or just generally their impressions of, of Fidem 3 when you first saw it. Yes, tell me. <laughs> <laughs> we spoke about the sea before, I think, yeah. the impression that that made. Yeah. I just, I just loved the way um, the opening just took us straight into all the kind of resonance um, that the sea holds for so many Caribbean people. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I, I, I'm an islander, and you know, there are all kinds of jokes about the fact that we don't we don't actually swim. Mm -hmm. we, we, you know, we especially the girls, right? So that so the sea is always partly partly terrifying mm -hmm. and later on we learn all kinds of things about the history that makes it partly terrifying mm -hmm. but as children um, we discover it as a place where you can sit and play in the water so this this kind of contrast as, as small mm -hmm. children but this kind of contrast with the sea as this huge unrelenting force to come in on that in this did exactly, I, for me, uh, I think what you wanted it to do, which was to evoke that ancestral presence. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, and, and then all the, of course, I, I, as, a, as, as a viewer, with lots of associations about the sea and about the ancestral presence, in a way, I wanted to stay with that historical moment. Mm -hmm. But you know, you're mean. So, <laughs> so, you are just mean. So, so you you know you you keep <laughs> um, and 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 it's it's great because it it holds it. The tension is there. Because you keep, mm -hmm. you know, as soon as we get a bit comfortable, you keep uh, breaking it up and taking mm -hmm. us somewhere else and making us think and making us move. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, the, the, the bits of um, 
the, the, the movement from the sea to kind of dance hall to, mm-hmm. you know, all of those things. I think what for me, it is the tension and the <sighs> refusal on your part as mm-hmm. artists to, to let me be comfortable in a sense mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. With, with what mm-hmm. I know. And that works. It, it is uncomfortable at first, but it mm-hmm. works. So for me, it works. I kept thinking, why? Well, you know, <laughs> slow down. Not not so much, but it is <laughs> it is absolutely right that it should be. Um, and I think I think uh, audience or participants shouldn't have the time and the space to to settle in and get comfortable, mm-hmm. um, because that is precisely that is precisely the work of the ancestral spirits, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. You know, just just not to allow us to stay, mm-hmm. to get too comfortable about all that's all that's past and all that's present. But it but also, you know, the Caribbean history is like that. Mm-hmm. We do there are some some ways in which it's cyclical. We go back to the same old mm-hmm. things. We were surprised mm-hmm. about the Windrush. Mm-hmm. We, we didn't expect it to happen. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But why didn't we expect it to happen? Mm-hmm. That you know that is the history. It happens mm-hmm. over and over again, except that it changes guys. Mm-hmm. So, you know, that, that, that's where I was watching uh, the, the third, the third rendition, as it were. Yeah. Series. Yeah. Thank you, Joan. Thank Denise. You. Oh, yes. Um, yeah, I love, I, I love the idea, the, the concept of ancestral interference. And I love that you, you present it electronically. And mm-hmm. also electromagnetically, <laughs> right? Mm-hmm. I mean, that presence and the colors and and then and the image, mm-hmm. the whole thing is very, uh, as you say, you, you use the term frenetic uh, mm-hmm. in, in some description. And then, of course, I also love how it makes us think um, of time, thinking of um, ancestral ancestral claims beyond time, without time, but also without without blood, <laughs> without mm-hmm. living. Um, mm-hmm. Which I think makes it makes openings for for thinking for releasing blackness from a particular kind of thinking, um, mm-hmm. and um, and thinking from from here right from this side of the Atlantic Ocean, it's um, I was also uh, invited by by your piece to think about claims uh, ancestral claims that are not mm-hmm. land based as mm-hmm. you know, it's the case of indigenous claims here, but ancestral claims that uh, relate, relate to the ocean, but not like the middle passage, mm-hmm. but precisely those who didn't make the passage. And, mm-hmm. uh, and then an invitation to think about uh, the not making it, not in terms of something that never happened and then that's dead, but actually the dead mm-hmm. as what could have been, right? Mm-hmm. What could have been. Uh, that that possibility that that future that now that mm-hmm. uh, didn't make it but the yeah, added haunts us right is ours mm-hmm. um, mm-hmm. so yeah thinking along those lines i thought uh, i think the piece is beautifully it brings it all out as it disturbs us <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> right and that's i think that's a kind of um of critical it, that is a, a critical element to 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 that effect of you know to thinking of ancestrality along those lines, or maybe not even thinking, just presenting mm-hmm. ancestrality along mm-hmm. those lines. We don't need to think, mm-hmm. <laughs> right? Yeah. Sometimes, yeah. yeah. Don't always have to. Yeah, I mean, no. it, exactly. It does that so brilliantly. I think holding that tension together of the, like, I guess the sea as a as an archive of disaster, in mm-hmm. a way that's mm-hmm. really, but that story's been told. But then. Um, mm-hmm also that potential. Um, and I I wanted to sort of, 
actually wanted to remind our, our viewers that they can post questions in the chat if you have any questions for Zinzi, Denise, or Joan. Um, please post those and we'll get to those shortly. But before we do, I wanted to um, to bring up sound. I guess music mm. is such a big thing in, um, in your work and in your life, mm -hmm. I suppose, mm -hmm. kind of growing up within sound system culture. I'm curious mm -hmm. about this, like, the way the work pulses, like this mm. vi vibratory thing where like, mm -hmm. I feel like I'm being shaken on a molecular level. To some <laughs> extent. And then Denise, some of Denise's work has has a kind of a, a depth, the depth of the bass in some of her filmmaking as well, mm -hmm. brought that mm -hmm. to mind when I was watching. Um, so I wonder, could you talk us through some of that decision-making for you? Yeah, I mean, I think you, you touched on it. Like, like, I mean, sure, that sound is is a big part of my life. Like, my dad is a DJ. Um, I grew up with a sound system in my house. Um, I think almost every man in my family is a DJ at the family party, at least. Like, everybody can touch the turntable, you know? Like, at some point in a wedding or a funeral or a christening, of which there is music at all, you know? And I think... Like my mum's house, she lives She lives at 47 on her road. So she's in the middle and she wakes up in the morning and opens the front door and she has this like paper mache tiger that was a wedding present. And she puts it in front of the door to keep the door open. And she, she puts on all of the like magical buttons. And this is how I remember it as a kid, like all of these magical buttons on my dad's system. And it's like, doo -doo 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 -doo. like, and the house starts to kind of, vibrate into the morning and everybody knows my mum's house like that that and the cats because my mum loves animals she loves cats and I think maybe at the time as like a black woman with long locks that was also maybe something people weren't used to seeing so also the cats are like running out of the house and everybody knows my mum's house for that sound and that's how I used to wake up and as, as a child I'd be like annoyed because maybe I wanted to sleep in on Saturday and instead <laughs> the music was going to go up and so there is something for me that is very homely about it is very like in a way it's kind of the opposite of, of maybe what you're supposed to say as an artist is it's it's not a thing it's it's a nothing it's it's, it's a normal it's a neutral mm -hmm. for me to have this kind of real big pulse of a bass like that's restful for me um to feel music um and i think also kind of more uh let's say like a different type of thinking or a different type of reasoning around that sound is that it is it is kind of the genesis of so many different sounds, that sound system in, in what we acknowledge, but also the way people love to forget how much music is generated out of the Caribbean, how much the sound system has done. And I, on a personal, like, no, I'm always really in awe of how much cultural production as like African diasporic, but Caribbean people, we managed to produce out of such a state. Like I'm always so stunned. The more I learn, I'm just like blown away. And I, I remember being at dance school and, and a girl that I was often paired with, because you're always paired with someone your height to do partner work. So I was always with her, Tara, she was called. And she was like, said to me, how do you dance like that? Like, what, what is it you're hearing? What is it you're doing? And you know, I'm like young little old dancer. And I never forgot the thing that I said to her was that we dance at births, weddings and funerals. We always dance. And there's something about that persistence that isn't always about defiance. It's just, it's the morning and it's time. And that's going to be the rhythm of your day. And I wanted that in the work. I wanted sonically for it to take over, like, like to build a world. And when, you know, the work is played live and much of my work, not just my film work, there's always this tension with sound. People always want to turn it down. People always want to talk about health and safety. The Tate told me it was a conservation issue. There's like always this thing with the, with the sonics of, of the work. And sometimes I think some more can happen when you suspend one sense. That's why like raves are so brilliant because it's dark and you can't talk and other things can happen with your body when you're not so occupied with other things. And I like that the sound kind of envelops you and then you can go through this process and then you're kind of out the other end, hopefully like a little bit, you know, polished up and ready again, you know? Mm -hmm. that's, that's what my mum would say, ready again. <laughs> 
<laughs> born again, ready to go. Yeah. That's it. Um, that's really brilliant, I think. And I'm, I'm also reminded about um, about Carnival, the presence of Carnival in mm -hmm. Fidem 3 as one yeah. of those spaces where that kind of thing is cultivated amongst people who know, like, they've grown up around that and they feel that. And yeah. that presence is is felt in more ways yeah. than one. I guess the other thing I would say is that, like, it's a cultural... Uh, it's a cultural marker for people who who understand and I think I'm really interested in like hidden it's not hidden it's actually not hidden it's just like if you don't speak the language you don't see it I'm not actively trying to hide it but I think I like the fact that it functions on different levels and yeah you like you mentioned carnival and I guess it's important to say that people people think of carnival as a sonic space and those in the know know that carnival is a protest in a sonic space but people never think about carnival as the biggest dance protest in the world people don't talk about that and for me as a dancer I'm always coming back to these spaces as dance spaces I, where people are mostly focused on them as sonic spaces rave blues carnival punk rock and there's kind of little or no observation for the fact that people are dancing and so even though there's this there's this film work and there's this sound work, most of the imagery is of people moving mm. and like what, what it must feel like, and for some of us, what we know it is like to have the freedom of moving your body in these small spaces when you have very little freedom. And that for me is like actually where my passion of dance comes from is learning about the freedom to move my body when I have little freedom. Mm. And, and I can always do it. I don't need anything. I can do it. If I'm naked, if I'm close, if I'm poor, if I'm rich, I can do it. And I think it's an under, it's an under discussed part of, of blackness and culture is actually like the, the freedom that like unfree people find mm -hmm. in moving their own body. Mm. Um, you mentioned before that I don't have to aspect of, of, mm. of your coming, your awakening your subjectivity mm -hmm. as a as a performer or beyond a performer, yeah. right? Like once yeah. you step outside the strictures of that training and you say, mm -hmm. so this is the aspect of I can create these mm -hmm. moments of freedom and then I don't have to in other mm -hmm. regards as well. So like something really productive seems to happen there. Um I wanted mm -hmm. to um to ask uh, to throw it back to Denise really quickly about sound in your work um and the presence of that that sort of that deep um visceral feeling that that it creates. Yeah, in the, um, yes, in, in the films, uh, definitely. And uh, with Arjuna, it is it is an element that we, we from Serpent Lane, we wanted to have it there. We want to have the sound doing some work of, um, doing some work which is of bringing folks to where we want them to be without time, right? Because the proposition mm -hmm. of Serpent Lane is, uh, the challenge of a film without time. And sound mm -hmm. is where that, that's playing out. And I think in Four Waters also, but um, but in terms of, I was thinking now as Zinzi was speaking about a dance and carnival, uh, because in Brazil, carnival is so much about the dance, like it's kind mm -hmm. of the opposite. It is more about mm -hmm. the, the body, the, the moving than the, mm -hmm. than the sound. But at the same time, um, uh, we, I also grew up with with music because you know mm -hmm. Brazilians cannot sing all the time, and we sing because we are sad, because we are desperate, mm -hmm. because we're depressed. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you are always singing, and I was thinking about uh, how it shows in in my writing, and I think it shows in my writing. But since I can't sing, and I can't play an instrument. Mm -hmm. uh, I think maybe it is in the movement of, of the writing because every time mm -hmm. I'm writing, I find myself wanting to get something like a rhyme, but it's never, mm -hmm. it's not ever it actually, mm -hmm. but it is, there is a rhythm that it's there, mm -hmm. but it's a rhythm of dancing more than, you know, how you, it's, it's, I, don't, I don't know how to explain it, but it's not, it's not sound like, but mm -hmm. it is about, you know, moving with, with sound because so much is about rhythm and i think probably it is I mean, about rhythm yes mm, joan with the kind of your literary background you'd maybe attest to this i guess the significance of rhythm and whether it's prose or poetry i suppose like 
um, what someone unlocks a rhythm or mm -hmm. something to that effect, um, how transformative that is in terms of, of conveying ideas. Um, yeah, uh, yes, and I, I think to go back to Zinzi's uh, discussion about the about carnival. Mm -hmm. Um, one of the one of the things that I have come to understand about um, Caribbean culture, and for example, Eastern Caribbean culture, which is very much carnival orientated, mm -hmm. uh, is the way in which everybody everybody takes part. Mm. and mm -hmm. sound as well as movement mm -hmm. are both integral to that taking part mm -hmm. it's interesting because here in london it mm -hmm. all because i grew up in the caribbean it always seems to me so strange that carnival you know there, there's discussion about whether it's funded or not Nobody expected when I was a child mm -hmm. or carnival to be mm -hmm. funded. Everyone mm -hmm. takes part mm -hmm. because it's it's a it's a it's a communal activity, mm -hmm. and it is also um, it's also remembered very early in the whole program that it was about stealing time. Mm -hmm. You know, we still get up while it's dark, as mm -hmm. those people did hundreds of years ago, mm -hmm. to go out and and perform the kind of secret um, uh, rituals, if you like, mm -hmm. because it is the same story we tell again. Mm -hmm. And I just wanted to connect, reconnect with that because. It was in that space that I first learned something about Caribbean history, not as history, mm -hmm. but as ritual that is performed that, right. that the community puzzles over. Mm -hmm. You know, why are those people painted in black engine oil mm -hmm. and going around with chains mm -hmm. and making that noise with their fingers and chanting? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Nobody, nobody explained, and as I think still, I've I've watched people watching carnival, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and it, it especially yeah. here um, in the UK where we we expect to have everything teased out verbally, uh -huh. Uh -huh. everything really, mm -hmm. you know, it has to be understood, it has to be explained. Otherwise, it has no value. Yeah. I think that, you know, there's a real tension between that way of knowing and this way of knowing. And I think that's mm -hmm. some of what you capture in, the, in, in your work. A lot of it is unexplained, and that's okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? But, yeah, but also, it, I, I had to, in writing the libretto, I had to discover how to translate sound that's going into my head. And, mm -hmm. and again, that's very interesting because I had to have the tune, the music in my head to what I was saying or what I was writing, even though I knew that the final music would not be the music be that yeah. was in my head. Yeah. I'm yeah. really, yeah, I'm really excited by what you're saying, um, Joan. I think this like thing about explanation is always something that has troubled me. And I think partly for the reasons that you explain between cultural differences, but also that as a dancer, you you are you understand or and or you are trained in bodily knowledge. And your your you are like your education is a is is a there is always a clear understanding that there are things that you experience and understand physically that reside in the physical, and there are things that you feel 
and it, that that are just of the body that kind of get lost in translation like I've often said like there is no translation like I, I really accept that there are things that I feel and happen to me physically that just will not ever manifest in in the word and not at all they they fall apart in translation and I think that there's something really exciting in accepting that and, and mm. accepting what happens in the baseline to you like that when that when that force fills you up that that's ancestral interference I don't need to it doesn't need to be like anything other than that I don't I don't need to question why why I feel so much I can just feel so much mm. I don't have mm. to know why I felt that and I also mm. do want to say Denise just just to say you were the person who taught me about time long before I met anybody else talking about all of these temporalities people I, I still don't understand it was when I met you and we sat in that room and you just started to kind of divide time and I remember looking at you and being like wow like like honestly like real like like the emoji like the actual original emoji the first time it happened to me of 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 understanding that there are many times happening and not just like intellectually like you know Kronos or Kairos like I think I'd heard of that at that point, because there was a LGBT organization called Kairos, but it was deeper than that. It was, it was multi-layered and it was like textured and it re- it really excited me. And I think definitely spurred on some of my thinking of, of ac- accepting different narratives at the same time and different speeds. So thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you for inviting me to a space that has really given me a decade of learning of what it means to share space with different types of feminists. You know, like the reason I wanted to do this talk is because you taught me that there is value in different voices when I was really young, like you respected my voice and you invited it into a space. And I think that's what enables me to want to make spaces that aren't just millennials like me. Mm-hmm. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and I, <laughs> not just us, yeah. <laughs> not not just us, you know. Yeah. So thank you. Yeah, I second that. I'm really incredibly grateful. Um, I realize we're we're getting close to to time. Um, okay. There are a couple of questions in um mm-hmm. in the chat. Let's see if we've got one here. It says does does interference? I think it's meant to say interference. Does interference disrupt? the very idea of ancestry. I think your dance film work is doing that. Could you perhaps share your thoughts on this about kinship? And then in quotes, it says, the without blood. I think the without blood might have been Denise's statement. Um, But yeah, does does interference disrupt the idea of ancestry as much as it, I guess it brings it to light? I can I understand the question like as like does 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 the idea that interference potentially I guess what the person asking the question is thinking is like is interference meaning that you shouldn't be there that you are encroaching Mm -hmm. which is maybe like not the way I'm using the word interference it's Mm -hmm. it's more like I've been speaking to Gail Lewis this week um about about this word interference and she said the word I think the word is inter- to intercede and it's actually it's it's only an interference because of the lack of acknowledgement but it isn't a question of the right for that interference to be it's not a it's not an interference that carries blame mm-hmm. it's it's an interference to a white supremacist capitalistic narrative of how the world has come to be and the, the ancestral interference is is the static or the electricity that just keeps frigging it up mm-hmm. and it's just not going to let it be plain sailing but it is um it is an entitlement it's not it's not that type of interference mm. i hope that answers the question that's really that's really great um i i guess it ties into the question of the, of the glitch i wondered if mm-hmm. you could maybe like speak to the way that the glitch functions in the work maybe yeah uh I think it, in, it initially started as like, you know, literally the glitch that or the static that happens on a TV. I first used it in What Kind of Slave Would I Be? Mm-hmm. Which is the work or that I made the um, the kind of set um, via film. And um, yeah, it's this feeling for me, the glitch is like what racism feels like where you kind of like, did that just happen? Did I, did I see that? Did I feel that? 
it's it's the the feeling of the question like oh what really and sometimes that happens in the moment and sometimes that happens four weeks or four years later where you're like oh my god that's why that happened and it's this constant it's kind of like if you've got bad sky or like any for anyone back in the day who likes to use like used to have like cracked sky or like a box with a with a chip in it and sometimes your channel would just like <laughs> and I feel like in some ways that's what having a black life feels like like you don't have the the best service for what a life can be you're not given the full access to what your life can be it's full of glitches and you still have to try and watch the show like you still have to try and live a life even though you're constantly being given like a poor picture or poor housing like or poor health you know like insert whatever in, in into a poor picture and, and I think the glitch is the closest thing I have found to that feeling you get when you're trying to blink away racism and you're just kind of like wow you know mm. um thank you for that Zinzi and thank you, Denise and Joan, um, for joining me in conversation this evening. I think that's us getting very close to, to time as much as I'd love to continue this conversation. Um, thank you so much. Such well, a pleasure. It's been a pleasure. Really I'm nice. so happy to see you. I just wanted to mention Heidi Sophia Mercer yeah. was the person who was there. That's it. Heidi, yeah. yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah. I hope yeah. it's not so long till I see your faces. In the flesh. In the yes. flesh. Mm -hmm. In the flesh. Yeah. In yeah, the yeah. flesh. <laughs> yes. Yes. Holding yes, out for I'm that one. To that. Oh, wow. Yeah. And congratulations on the work, Zinzi. You've just, it's just amazing. It is. Thank really. you. Beautiful. Thank you so really, much. Really that means a lot. Thank you. Really yeah. brilliant. And before we go, I just wanted to say a quick reminder that you can mm -hmm. see the work for them through Ancestral mm -hmm. Interference um, until Thursday, the 26th of November on our website, spikeisland.org.uk. Um, many thanks to Spike Island's commissioning partners, Beric Film and Media Arts Festival and Transmissions in Glasgow. Thanks to my colleagues at Spike who've made this event possible, Olivia Jones, Tom Ketteringham, Ali Roche, Jane Farham, Rosa Martin. Special thanks to my lovely interlocutors this evening, Denise, Joan, mm -hmm. Zinzi, and Zinzi obviously for making this possible, for bringing us together with your film. Um, and just before we go, um, I just wanted to say, as um, Zinzi mentioned before, she's been in conversation with the scholar, activist, and psychotherapist, Gail Lewis, and the kind of product of that exchange of voice memos will be up on our website early next week. So do keep an eye out for that. Um, it'll be brilliant. Um, so be Very sure cute. to check that out. Um, and as usual, we welcome your donations. I think one of my colleagues will be posting a link in the, um, in the chat, but thanks so much for joining us again. And we hope to see you next time. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Bye. Cheers. Thank you. Bye. Bye.